דקה. כן, בסדר גמור, אנחנו יכולים להתחיל. אוקיי. בוקר טוב. So today's topic, I guess, uh, because it's sort of last minute this year, we'll do something for Parsha Balak. And there's, um, who can tell me, uh, you can volunteer and talk, who can tell me uh, the way that Bilam is described, who else in Chumash is described in a similar manner? Like Bilam, as far as his abilities. Laban. Who? Laban. Laban. Avraham. Yeah, Avraham Avinu. Give me some examples. Left with two, two ads uh, going to the thing is Hamor. Uh, yeah. Was, yeah. In, in the Midrash, Avraham's travel to the Akedah is very similar to um, the uh, Bilam and Donkey. Um, the whole thing, Etashir Tabrech Tavorach Vashir Tor, you are the idea of Brachan Klala and of Baruch and Aror. It's very classic to Avraham and to him. And and where they both come from, they both come from Aram Naharaim. We learn in Sefer Dvarim that Bilam was from Aram Naharaim. And for sure, in our parsha it says, Torah from Abraham Nahar, our ship by the Euphrates. So there's a couple of things. In fact, Pirkei Avot makes a big deal about it and talks about there's Tamidim of Avram Avinu in contrast to Tamidim of Bilam. Bilam is called Bilam Harasha. The problem is when you read Parshat Shavua, it doesn't make sense to call Bilam a Rasha because he's a, he seems to be, I mean, if he's a Rasha, boy, I can imagine what it takes to be a Tzadik. He's probably one of, we use him, we quote him in davening. Uh, he does pretty good things. He's, he's pretty dedicated to God. So what I want to do today, the main goal that today share is to understand what's the biblical meaning of Brachot and Cholot. And there's a big question in methodology. When I read Parshat Bilam or Parshat Bala, what the rabbis call Sefer Bilam. Is the story written to tell me what happened? Because I need to know what happened and how, God, how great God was and we were almost destroyed by this magic curse in the desert, but God saved us at the last minute. It sounds almost like Moshe Rabbeinu saying in Sefer Dvarim later on, that uh, remember what says, remember uh, not, to, not to intermarry with Ammon and Moab because they didn't treat you uh, with bread and water when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired... Uh, Bilam to curse you, but I saved you from that curse. So it could be that we need to know how great God is, and that's the goal of Chumash, to know how great God is and how, what she, how much he protects us. And therefore, I need to know all these great things that God did for us, and he prevented us from this magical curse of uh, Bilam. Or is there something uh, more profound or more basic to a deeper theme of Chumash, of not how great God is, but how we need to behave, and what's our relationship with God? My overall claim is when you read Chumash, the overriding theme is that what does it teach us about our eternal relationship with God, both as human beings with God and both as, and even more so as God's nation representing God. And I want to read the story from that point of view. What, what's my take-home message for all generations uh, from, that, um, from the story? And pretty much the goal this year is to understand the Haftarah we're going to read from Sefer Micha. So let's get to work. First thing I want to do, that was my little stall. I guess whatever's online is online. Let me just check. Okay, got the chat. That's fine. Now, um, what I want you to do first, actually, you'll, I guess, agree with me. I want to break the story, which you're all familiar with, into, I guess, uh, four or five, I guess, acts or scenes, or um, I'll make like an outline. The first topic, I'm going to call the invite. In other words, Bil um, Balak is scared. He invites Bilam to come and curse the people. And, um, and the whole question of sending the invitation First, Bilam saying no, and then saying uh, yes, but a qualified yes. Now, I call that the first topic. The next topic I call Bilam and Donkey, or basically Bilam's journey from, from his hometown to Moab, from Aram Naraim, or from Torah, to Aram the journey with the donkey. That's a whole unit by itself. And then we have three rounds of blessings. Everyone knows it's a good, good old three plus one. There's three rounds of blessing that share a very common format, which we'll see. And then there's one final prophecy I call, I'll call it the final prophecy. And we'll differentiate between the final prophecy and the three rounds of blessings. You'll see very soon how, how they're different. But I hope you understand my, my point, my um, outline. My outline's gonna be the invite, the, um, the journey to Moab, three rounds of blessings, and then the final prophecy. 
What I want you to do on your own, everyone open up your chumash. Just, I want to make sure we're all in line. Just take, take a quick, um, people are having trouble hearing? Wait, this, we'll double, someone just wrote me that people are having trouble hearing, maybe? No Anyone problem. else having trouble? No problem. Okay. So it's probably on, uh, on, on your side on the speaker. Okay. Um, take, open up your chumash. I'll open up mine as well. And tell me, open up to chapter 22. Actually, you know what? The first thing I want you to do is look in your chumash, the first line of the parsha. With what pasuk does the parsha begin? Let me share my screen. And it'll open up to Sefer Bar. for chapter 22. And something very strange happens. If you look in your chumash, it's very different than in a, in a, in a, in a chapter divided Tanakh. The first line of Parshat Balak begins with Pasuk Bet instead of Pasuk Aleph. But the Parshat division, the Samach, or the Parshat division, is at the end of Parshat Chukat. Now, I want to explain the reason for that argument, the difference between our, our Masorah, our tradition, of starting a new unit with Pasuk Bet, with Bayar Balak, and the Parshat that ends with the conquest of Sihon and Og, that we read last week, and we finished traveling after all those battles, and we set up camp in our boat Moab, maybe in the day Now, the reason why the chapter divider put this um, together with chapter 22 is because the story of Balak and Bilam happened when Amisro is in our boat Moab. It's real simple. On the other hand, the, um, this last line of chapter one, of, of chapter 22, the first line of chapter 20, really f- finishes the story, we'll go back to at the end of chapter 21 and see it. We had a very logical story of defeating the two and a half, the, uh, the kings of Sihon and Og. And God told Moshe, don't worry about attacking Og. And then we traveled to, after defeating uh, Sihon and Og and, and our conquest, then we continue and travel to, uh, we tra- B'nai Israel continued to travel and set up camp on our vote Moab. Now, look in your Tanakh, hope you have a Tanakh corner similar. There's a Parshia break, not a Parshia Chibua, but a Parshia break, like the paragraph break at the beginning of Parshia Balak. Take a look how long it goes still. If you have your good old Tanakh corner like this kind, remember this kind, take a look how many chapters is the next Parshia. Take a quick look inside. And notice, the parshia begins in Parashat Bet Pasuk Bet, Parashat Balak, and it goes all the way to the end of chapter twenty-four. See that? With no, with no, no paragraph breaks in the middle at all. That's what the rabbis call Masechet Baba Batra, Sefer Bilam. There's a whole sefer that's sort of inserted into Chumash, and in Masechet Baba Batra, the rabbis talk about who wrote this book, and they have to tell us that. Moshe Rabbeinu wrote this book, and not Bilam, because Bilam was a Navi. Maybe Bilam wrote it. How does anyone in Amisar know about this story? I might think that this is a standalone story, maybe written by Bilam, because he's the one involved. So Chazal tells us, no, this is a story written by Moshe Rabbeinu, which means God gave the story to Moshe Rabbeinu to teach us something. Now, if you can do something really interesting, I'll call it shift delete, if you remember your computers. Take that whole unit from chapter 22 to 24, and Thematically, just delete it from Chumash. And look how Chumash reads. If I take the last line of Parshat Chukat, which is, we defeated the battle, we defeated Sichon and Og, and then in the last line of Parshat Chukat, which is 22.1, Vice B'nai Israel travel, they set up camp at Avot Moav, opposite Yericho. The first line of chapter 25 is, the famous story of Am Yisrael sinning with Mnot Moav. If I didn't have the story in between about Balak and Bilam, I would think that as soon as we arrived in our vote Moab and set up camp about to conquer Israel, about to cross the Jordan, as soon as we arrived there, we begin sinning with the daughters of Moab, that terrible incident. And therefore, we'll see that one of the reasons for the insert is going to, to explain the background, what led to the sin, and we'll see the connection between Bilam and the sin of the daughters of Moab. So now we're going to get to work. Go back to chapter 22 in the beginning. And where would you finish the invite scene? Let's take a look at the end of chapter 22 when the invite is over. If I take a look on your own, 
Um, I would end it with Pasachaf. But the first invite he says, you know, and then he says, wait, we'll try another time. The next night, God says, go, but on condition. So listen, um, he asks him, um, what will be, you know, wait one more day, and we'll see what God tells me at night. And let's read Pasachaf together. And notice, it's the end of an Aliyah as well. This is the end of the second Aliyah, right before Shlishi. If the people are just calling you, inviting you to come, then it's okay to come with them. But what's the caveat? You can go with them. I didn't give you permission to curse them. I gave you permission to go with them. Got it? So remember, they're inviting Bilam to come and curse the Jewish people. Bilam says, I can go with you. But he didn't say I can't curse either. He said, I can only do what God allows me to do. And pay attention to this. He'll be saying this over and over again. Again, how's, how does the second Aliyah end? Elim comes to Bilam and tells him, if they're calling you, go and go with them. Kum. Lechitam. Remember, get up and go with them. But remember, only do what I tell you to do. And therefore, Bilam Bilam Baboker. And then we have the story of Bilam and Donkey, which is a story in itself really interesting. We're not going to deal with it. But we'll talk about when that story ends. Let's look at the end of the story. Skipping the whole incident with the, uh, with the donkey, but notice there's three there's rounds of three, which is going to be a classic pattern here in the story. Let's see where it ends. Um, we'll start with Pasuk Lama Dalet. V'yemer Bilam HaMalach Hashem Chattati Ki Yadati Ki Yata Ki Lo Yadati Ki Yata Nitzav Vikrati Bilam apologizes to the Malach and hence to the donkey for stopping the way. And this is about time, Ram Beinecha Shubali. If I'm doing the wrong thing, I'll go back. Listen what the Malach tells him. Vayimar Malach Hashem El Bilam. Lech Iman Hashem. Go with these people. On the other hand, the Ephes, it's okay to go with them, but what? Et adavar sher daber, lech otot to daber. Velech Balak in Sarei, Velech Bilam in Sarei Balak. He says, on what condition can you go? God doesn't say again it's okay to curse or to bless. He says, what? Only do what I tell you to do. What I'm trying to point out is there's still a possibility that he'll be able to curse. Malach tells him, don't go to curse. You can only do what I tell you to do. But you have to follow my instructions. And therefore, Bilam continues. Now, in theory, I could end the journey here, but I think it continues. Why? By Shema Balak, Kiba Bilam. Balak hears that Bilam is arriving together with this uh, ministers who were sent. And he goes out to meet him, to Ir Moav. Asher Agvul Arnon, Asher Bikse Agvul. And every year day, We'll leave the geography alone for now. When they arrive, what does Balak do? Balak tells Bilam, then I send you uh, to call you. you know, how come you didn't come right away? What's the, what took you so long? Don't you think I can honor you and pay you properly? Notice here, Pasek Lam is going to end the next Aliyah, if I'm not mistaken. The next Aliyah ends exactly here, and we'll see why in a minute. The Aliyah ends as follows. Um, what to say? Listen to this recurring theme. I've arrived. What can I say? I can only do what God allows me to. I did not agree to come to curse. I came to give it a try. And then uh, they start the journey. Now, after this, there's going to be three rounds of blessings. What I want you to do now, um, look at the end of the parsha. Go to the end of Parak Chavdalid, and I want to show you where the three blessings end. This is important for a pattern. If I look at the uh, at the end, in Pasuk, in Parak Chavdalid, skip to Pasuk Yedalid. Again, chapter 24, verse 14. Pasuk Yedalid. This is what he says. Vata hini olech la'ami. I'm going back to my people. I'm going to give you some advice. What's going to happen to your people at the end of days? Probably means like the next, within the next coming generations. Not in the end of days like we say, but usually means at the end of a time period. Now, Pasuk Yudal begins something new. Because what happens? By Samashol Yamar, and then we have this famous, this is actual, the only time that Bilam says things on his own. And, does, and God doesn't put words in his mouth. 
Notice, um, Bilam lifts up his mashal and he says, Nun Bilam ben Be'or, Nun Agerosh Tuma'ayin, Nun Imra'el. He introduced himself, I'm the one speaking, and then he gives his whole Nebuah about what's going to be in the future, which is a bit cryptic. But my point is, is that your Dalit ends, your Dalit begins the final prophecy, and sure enough, that's exactly where the sixth Aliyah begins, or seventh Aliyah. If you look in your Chumash, Shvi'i begins exactly right here. We post it Yudalad. What I want to show you, the chapter division, I mean the Aliyah division, is we can learn a lot from it. Now we're going to be in the main part of the year. There's three rounds of blessings that we're all familiar with. Now it's three times um, Bilam tries to curse, and instead he ends up blessing. God puts the words in his mouth. This Pasek Yadalad in Perech Adal, that begins the fourth round, which is not a round, it's a standalone. It doesn't fit the same pattern. What I do want to show you is how the three all follow the same pattern. What's the pattern? Let's, let's begin with the last one. How does it end? I mean, actually, we'll do this together. I want to suggest the following. Let's go back to the previous Aliyah, and we'll see exactly how it began. I followed the Aliyah break. Look at the beginning of Shishi. And it's going to be in Perech of Gimel, Pasuk Chav Zayn. Okay? Let's go back to Perech of Gimel, Pasuk Chav Zayn. And I want you to follow the pattern. I'm purposely starting with the last blessing to understand where the first two begin. Okay. Um, starting from Pasuk Chav Zayn, we'll follow the, where the new Leah begins. This is what happens. I'm going to call this step one. Vayomer Balak Abilam, Lachan Nai Kachacha. Balak tells Bilam, I'm going to take you to another place. I'm a Komacher. Ulai Yishtar Bene Elohim, Bakapatolim Misham. Vaykach Bilam at Bilam, a Rosh Abor, and Nishkaf Afanei Shimon. What I want to show you that every round of these three rounds begins with Balak taking Bilam to a different place, but always to a high place. With Balak says, let's go to a different place and sort of joking, let's get higher. Let's go to a high spot. Why? Maybe this would be straight or good in the eyes of God and he'll allow um, you to curse him from there. And therefore he goes, uh, Bilam takes him to Rosh Hapoor, which is looking over the, over the desert. Now, why is this so important? Balak and Bilam totally understand that Bilam can only do what God tells him to do. It's a repeating theme all the way through the parsha. When Bilam leaves, what does God tell him? He didn't say, do not curse or do not bless. He says, only do what I tell you to do. Bilam very much wants to curse the people. And Balak for sure wants him to curse the people. But Bilam, even though he wants to curse, and Balak wants him to curse them, Bilam is sort of held back because he can only do what God tells him to do. So what do you do when you want to do something, but God doesn't want you to do it? Well, we have to convince God to allow you to do something. How do you convince anyone in charge to get permission to do something? You have to beg them. So watch what Balak is doing to try to convince God to allow Bilam to bless them. What's Balak decide? You know what? If we want God on our side, let's go to a high place. Let's go to a high place. You know, that's a great place to dive from. To Rosh Hashanah, you ever been on Tulim, like in the desert or anywhere, you climb a mountain, you go to the top of a mountain, wow, it's a very spiritual, uplifting feeling. After they go to this new high place, this is what Bilam says, Pasach Haftet, Remember Bilam HaBalak, B'nei li b'ze shiba mizbachot, v'achen li b'ze shiba parim b'shiba ilin. On this high spot, build seven altars and bring seven sacrifices, seven cows, and seven rams on each mizbeach. And Balak does as Bilam says, and they bring the Korban. And then what happens? Bilam sees though, that it's not working, and then he goes and gives his blessing. But what I want to pay attention to, then Bilam begins his blessing, he gives up his mashkal, and he says, um, he starts with um, his opening statement, and good old Matavu Lachayako, that begins the blessing. Now, when the blessing is over, what happens? In Pasuk Yud, in Perech of Dalet, Vayichar af Balak el Bilam, Balak is very angry at Bilam, claps his hand, starts screaming at him, and Balak tells Bilam, 
I hired you to curse them. The call of Aikartiha, Vine Brach the Barech, that's Shalosh Pamim. Three times I hired you. I hired you to curse them. I we tried three times, and every single time you blessed them instead. And therefore, get out of here, right? Go run away to your place. I told you I could have honored you, and now you're not going to get any, any payment. And what's Bilam Sebak? I warned you, I told you, I can't curse them for sure, I can try, but I can only do what God says. I can only do what God allows me. Now let's, I want to review the pattern because it's really important. How's the pattern go? The pattern goes as follows. And I want to show it in, in the previous ones as well. Before each round, Bilam, I'm, I'm sorry, Balak invites Bilam, let's go to a high place. A new place, but to a high place. And maybe we can try to curse from there. All with the understanding that it's up to God to allow Bilam to curse. Maybe God will allow them, maybe God won't allow them. But Bilam can only do what God tells him. I need to convince God to allow Bilam to curse. Balak has a great idea. Let's go to a high place. With a great view, close up to God. How does Bilam answer him when he gets to that place? You know what? Great spot. Let's build altars and bring sacrifices to God. Maybe by sacrificing to God, that will convince God. Maybe if we bring him like a good, a really good sacrifice, a, a cow and a, and a lamb and a ram, maybe that will convince him to answer our prayers and allow us to curse them. And they try, but every single time they try, instead of a curse, it ends up with a blessing. And when it's over, Bilam gets, um, I'm sorry, Balak gets really angry at Bilam, yells at him, what's going on? And Bilam always answers the same answer, I told you so, only I can say what God allows me. You follow the pattern? Let's go back now and see if it fits to the second round. And again, if you follow the Aliyah setting, go back, we're in chapter 23 now. Go back to chapter 23. That was, we just did round three, let's look at round two. Just follow the Aliyah division. Follows perfectly what we're talking about. So look in Chamishi, where Chamishi begins, in chapter 23. In Perachat Gimel, Pasuk Yud Gimel. This is where the Aliyah begins. Let's see if it follows a pattern. Vayumer ela balak, lechna itiyala bakom acher. Balak tells Bilam, let's go to another place, where you can see in front, but only the edge of them. Not all part of them, and try from there. By Kechel states to fame, El Rosh Hapizga. Again, they go to a high place, Rosh Hapizga, on a field where you have a great view. And they build their seven Mizbachot and seven altars. What does Balak tell Bilam? By Yomer El Balak, Bilam tells Balak, Stand on your sacrifice. Now it's Davin. And I'll give a try. And God, by Bilam, and he puts words in his mouth. And says, tell him the following. And then, um, and he gives up his mashal. Instead of a curse, he gives a blessing. Um, and then what's he say? The famous one, the famous line we say in Daphne. When it's over, right? don't curse them, but don't bless them. What's going on? And what's Bilam say? Bilam says, I told hello, hello, I can only do what God says. You follow the pattern? You'll see why I'm making such a big deal about it in a minute. Every pattern, let's go to a high place. Let's curse, let's um, bring korbanot. At the follow, he brings it, he gives a blessing instead of a curse. Bilam gets, Balak gets angry and Bilam tells, I told you so. Now, we did all this to find round one. Uh, let's work backwards. How does round one end? Round one ends with, um, round two began again in, in uh, Pasuk Yud Gimel, chapter 23, just to show you that it's the same. How did round one end? Balak tells Bilam, what'd you do to me? I told you to, I want you to curse, and now you bless them. And Bilam answers, Notice every aliyah ends with the exact same line. I could only say what God allowed me to say. And that's why, at first glance, Bilam looks such a, uh, a tzaddik, he can only do what God tells him to do. What I want you to do now, go to the end of chapter 22 and find me where round one begins. Remember the pattern? Round one, let's go to a high place, bring carbonate, maybe that will get God on our side. 
So I want everyone to take a look now. Let's look at the end of chapter 21, at the end of chapter 22. After he arrives, remember the Aliyah ended in um, <coughs> in Pasuk in Pasuk um, Lamechet, I think. Remember the the Aliyah ended here in Lamechet. That's when they arrive. And remember what Bilam said, "Valak, I can only do what God told me to do." Look at Lamechet. Vayelch Bilam in Balak vayavol kiriat chutzot. Bilam and Balak go together, and they go to a place called Kiriat Chutzot. And they make a zevach. Now, would you consider this stage one? Let me turn off my, my share for a minute. Does that fit the pattern or not? Is this an example of going to a high place and bringing korbanot to get God on your side? Look carefully at those tubes who came again. And we'll take a vote. Hope you're with me. Let's see. Look at these two psukim. Bilam tells Balak, I'm sorry, um, these Lamatet men. Is this the beginning? Does this fit the pattern of the first round? Pasuka. Yeah. Who, who speaks? Say, say louder. <coughs> Who's the between the between the between the up the Bamot and the uh, Braham. You guys are looking for God. So you're saying it is the same pattern or different? Because it helps the car. It, it's a break in between because what's missing? They're, they're going. They're not going to a high place. They're going to Kerat Chutzol, which is like a shopping area. It's like some area, but it's not a high place. And is there a korban here or not? Does Bilam Tabalak is set up a mizbech and bring korbanot to God? It's something very different. Take a look. Let me go back to my screen again. I'm sorry. Um, where's my screen? What happened here? I just lost my connect. I lost my share screen. Here we go. Share screen. If you look carefully, Vaisbach Balak does not mean a korban. That means a cookout. That's a barbecue. Balak makes a barbecue. It's not a zebach lashem. It's a zebach like a regular barbecue. He makes a barbecue of bakar and son, which is cows and sheep. And he sends them to Bilam and to the Sarim that are with him. In other words, I call this a business lunch. Someone arrived and he sends some food. Let's have a, let's have a, uh, no, it's like, Balak is basically taking Bilam to lunch. Keep that in mind. We're going to return to these two psukim. We have to return to them in a minute. Now look at Pasik Memalach. Vaiba Boker, Vaikach Balak et Bilam, Vaileu Bamod Ba, Vayam Risham Tseam. Now this Pasuk Mem Aleph starts the pattern. Notice how the chapter division is just a disaster <coughs> through the whole, the whole part of the, the chapter division is boy off. I'm starting a new round of Pasuk Mem Aleph. What happens? Balak takes Bilam to a high place, looking at the people. And then what happens at the beginning of chapter 23? Bilam tells Balak, build for me seven misbachot and get ready, um, seven parim and seven elim. And Balak does, as Bilam said, and Balak and Bilam, <coughs> um, they bring korbanot on this Mizbeach. And then listen, Bilam tells Balak, Ki stand on your Olam, means pray to God by your sacrifice, and I'm going to go, maybe God will allow me, <coughs> and see what God's letting me say, and I'll tell you. And he goes, <coughs> and he goes to try to curse. Now, what I'm getting at is that round one begins exactly here, where Balak and the last line of Perak Chabet, where he takes him to a high place, and then they build seven mizbachot and bring Parva of Avizbech. What's the logic behind all this? Let me, let me explain what I'm trying to get at. The logic is, God never tells Bilam, do not curse the people. He didn't say you must bless the people. He says, only do what I let you do. You can only say what I allow you. Bilam is trying to get God to allow him to curse. And what's the logic? How do you get God on your side? Well, now we're going to talk, now we get to the most important topic. In general, this is a topic about religion and the, the classic understanding of religion. If you want someone on your side, if you want God on your side, you pray to God, don't you? But where's the best place to pray? High places, lofty high places, high mountains. That's a great place to daven. And 
How do you get God on your side? You bring sacrifices. You build, a, you build an altar for God and you bring a sacrifice to God and you feed him and you stand by your sacrifice and pour your heart out. He'll let you do what you want. It's a classic understanding of prayer where I go to a, a magnificent place, a place with a great view and a great sight, and I bring sacrifices to God. It's a classic mikdash, like building on a, on a, on a high hill, <coughs> magnificent building, and bring sacrifices to God. That'll get God on your side. Now, one of the biggest things that what I want to show you is ex exactly that classic understanding of religion, which is taught to this day, is what Chumash is fighting tooth and nail. It's not prayer, it's not sacrifice and high places that's going to bring God on your side. It's your, God is going to judge people based on their behavior. Even though most people think that the way to get a God or a powerful God on your side is to, is to butter them up, is to feed them. Why is that so important? Let's say you have a friend. Or let's say, I'll give you a real example. Let's say you're a lawyer and there's a potential client and you want that client to sign a contract with you. To get, you want to get your business from that client. You want that client to sign a deal. What do you do to convince him to take your offer? You take him out to lunch, don't you? If you're in Manhattan, let's say you're a lawyer in a big uh, law firm in Manhattan, there's, at least up until recently, there's lots of kosher restaurants in downtown that you can take your clients out to, and you can deduct it as a legitimate business expense. I'm sure there's an accountant here somewhere. If I'm not mistaken, is, can't, don't you consider that a, um, a legitimate business expense? If I, take, <coughs> if I take a client out for lunch in order to convince him to sign a contract to take my business, that's a legitimate business expense because how do you get human beings on your side? You feed them. And if that's how you get humans on your side, that's how you get God on your side. And if you want God, if God's all powerful and can do anything and you believe in that God, but you want him on your side, what do you do? You feed him and you pray to him and ask him, you know, pour your heart out to him. And the best place to do it, do it from a high place, from a magnificent place. And what I want to show you is that Chumash is teaching you that is then how you get God on your side. And one of the biggest themes from the time that Chumash began, I think that's the first 11 chapters of Chumash, God makes man, charges him <coughs> with uh, <coughs> putting him in charge of civilization. God wants man to do good. And when man does evil, God gets angry. God gives, makes member kind in heaven. Kind sin, sins, first, no, different types of sins. First, man sins in Gan Eden, gets his punishment. Kind sins, killing his brother, he gets his punishment. The whole generation of the flood sins for bad behavior, God brings punishment. People build a Tower of Babel for the wrong reason, they get their punishment. One of the biggest things in Chumash is that God has expectations from civilization. God made man, or humankind, with a purpose. God gave man the ability to do good or bad. God continues to oversee his creation. God wants civilization to go in a good direction, but warns them, go in a bad direction and I'll punish you. Go in a good direction, I'll help you. It, punishment doesn't come immediately, nor does reward come immediately, but that's a general pattern. And when things go bad, when things go bad, the question is, why are things going bad? And God wants man to learn from their mistakes and do better. And later, in Chumash, he's going to pick a nation to be the model nation that's going to do that, that's going to be the model nation of, <coughs> of the nation that God will bless when they follow the laws and he'll curse when, they're, when they don't follow the laws. That understanding of God is totally different than idol worship. Because in idol worship, what do you have? I believe in a rain god. Remember, let's say I say believe in many gods. There's a rain god, there's a war god, there's a sun god, there's a moon god, there's a wind god, there's a fertility god. There's like there's a grain god. There's a whole pantheon of gods we're all familiar with. What happens? How do you get a rain god on your side? Well, you do a dance for the rain god, or you do some type of ritual, and, the, and the, you build a house for the Baal god, or we'll see later, Poor. If this god has a specific power, he's in charge of rain, how do I get rain? I do a rain dance. Or I bring a sacrifice to the rain god, or I do some crazy ritual in front of that rain god. What I do for the sun god, I'll do some, I'll bring a sacrifice to the sun god to make sure the sun doesn't get too hot or takes care of my troops. There's going to be some fertility god. Every god has power, and to get that god on your side when you need him, you do some type of service, you feed them in some way or other. But 
the way that God treats you has nothing to do with your behavior. It only has to do with your own connection, your personal connection to that God, that specific God. Along comes Chumash with the revolution in religion. It's saying there's only one God, but it's not understanding just plain monotheism, there's one God as opposed to many gods. Not only is there one God, but this one God is in charge of all those powers and judges you based on your behavior, not based on your prayer or your, or your sacrifice. That's a revolution in religion that's hard to get over. It is so basic to Chumash. Now, let, I want to prove my point, and then first I'll prove it from Chumash, then I'll prove it from, from, um, from Chumash. I mean, I'll prove it then from the Navi Micham. What, what I want to claim is, I need the story of Balak and Bilam to understand a, a much deeper understanding of what the Jewish religion is about. It's almost counterintuitive to what most people think. It's not magical, it's logical. And people think that religion is about curses and blessings. And we have to come in and sort of disprove that. Now, what I want to show you, I want to bring, I want to bring a, a source, the key source about blessing and curses in Chumash, it's explicit as could be. It's so straightforward. It's in, towards the end of Chumash. It's, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, let me stop that share. Open up in Sefer Dvarim. Go to Perak Haftet, in Parshat Nitzavim, in your Chumash. Go to chapter 29. Put it right here in Deuteronomy. Chapter 29. <coughs> um, I'm sorry, my mistake. Chapter 28, my mistake. Chapter 28, in the end of Parshat Kitabo. Remember, there's the blessings and curses. There's the Tochacha in chapter 20, 28, and 28 and 29. In chapter 28, <coughs> I want to follow the word Baruch and pay careful attention. What does God say? This is so important. About that. Remember, I want to show you, this is Chumash's primary message of what brings blessings and curses. It's called the Tochacha. If you follow God to keep all of his commandments, which I'm commanding you today, God will put you in a leadership position above the nations. You're chosen to be his model nation. Keep my laws. Keep my laws. Serve me properly. Right? Build that just society that Sefer Jerem is all describing. And then I'll put you in a leadership position above the nations. And all, all these upcoming blessings will come with you and catch up with you and you'll, you'll achieve them. On what condition? Then watch the word. And then God should give your enemies. Um, you should defeat your enemies and more. God should command his blessing over you. All your asamecha and all your um, <coughs> asamecha is your agricultural input or output. Any profession you have and bless the land you're in. And here's a key line which goes back to Har Sinai. Keep God's laws. Like he told When you keep his laws. When you emulate God. Well, that's doing mishpat and staka. That's their Hashem. And then, All the other nations, because you're a nation in the central location in the Middle East, all these nations will see a prosperous nation, a nation that <coughs> is growing economically. God is blessing the nation. At the same time, they're keeping all this mitzvot of social justice, of kindness. We're building this model society of, of Kedoshim to you, a way of life that cares about everyone in society, that there's honesty. <coughs> and, um, and, and acting in a way that sanctifies God. And God blesses that nation with wealth and prosperity because they're keeping his laws. And in that way, God's name is associated with you. But what Chumash is screaming is that if you want a blessing from God, indeed, all the powers are this one God. This one God is in charge of everything, of the rain and, and everything, war, whatever it might be, there's one God in charge of everything. But it's not that prayer, not prayer is going to bring that God on your side, but rather your behavior. Now, it's important to pray to remember that you need to behave. For sure you need prayer. 
But the purpose of prayer is to remember the blessing doesn't come from prayer, it comes from, from behavior. But I need to pray to remember, and also I'm gonna remember when I've done something wrong, that God can, can, um, <coughs> that God can forgive me and give me another chance. What happens if you don't listen to God? Uh, to keep all of us laws, the exact opposite. Then, Aurora Taba Ir. Aurora Taba Sadeh. Aurora Tanacha. Exactly the opposite. Everything will be Aurora. Remember the thing with Eta Shir Tabak Tabarach Vashir Tabar you are? Here's the concept of Baruch and Aurora explicit. Chumash is screaming it. That if we don't follow God's laws, we're in big trouble. And it'll go out of its way to punish us. In fact, now we'll go to chapter 29 in Parshat Nitzavim, which is almost, it's almost scary what Chumash is saying. Let's say we don't keep God's laws. At the end, uh, what will happen? Um, God will have to come and punish us. Just like he punished Dom and Amoram. Other, when Amisa was being punished out of proportion compared to other nations, other nations will say, what's happening? Why is God's nation being punished so harshly? When the Amisa was punished out of proportion by their God, by this one God, other nations would say why they're being punished, because they didn't follow God. Not because this God doesn't exist or this God isn't powerful. In, in a roundabout way, in a very difficult way, we can sanctify God by being punished for a bad behavior, just like we can sanctify God by being rewarded for a good behavior. But no matter what, we're going to be representing God in the eyes of the nations. And that's going to be, my, my point, one of the biggest themes of Chumash. In fact, if we go back to the end of chapter 11, it's right before the, the whole section began, what did God say? Um, the beginning of Parshat A. Sorry, the beginning of Parshat A. Mereo nochi neten lechem ayom et abracha vat haklala, et abracha asher tishmu, vat haklala im not tishmu. I'm saying it's, it's, we say the same thing in Shema every day, don't we? If we follow God's laws, Shemot Yishmo Yitzhak Ablets Ablets Len, don't follow laws, you'll be thrown out. I'm, I'm trying to claim that that theme of a blessing and curse is the biggest theme in Chumash from cover to cover. <coughs> and, and that idea is what's revolutionary about Judaism compared to other ancient religions. Because once I have the understanding, not that there's many gods, but one God, it's called ethical monotheism. But this one God who has all the powers continues to oversee civilization and watches over God. God watches over his creation and blesses them and curses them based on their deeds. That hopefully will cause civilization to be good. Once that understanding is internalized, when it's understood, that's a transformative understanding that will lead people to better behavior. It's like if I if you take an example, let's say someone's convinced that eating healthy Healthy food will give you good health. Once you're convinced of that, you'll start eating healthy. At least you should start eating healthy. If you don't believe that there's a correlation between good, good diet and good health, then you won't eat healthy. You'll eat just whatever you feel like. <coughs> and therefore, we have to sort of um, internalize and understand that not only that God exists, but we're chosen to serve him to be his bottle nation. And by keeping his laws, we can receive a blessing if we keep his laws properly. And the fact that we see blessing for good behavior and receive punishment for bad behavior, that itself will sanctify the concept of God and be a model for other nations to learn from. Now, that's why many times we might be deserving of a punishment, but we also have what's called Bidat Torah Hamim, God has um, um, attributes of mercy. And even though we're deserving punishment, part of our prayer is to pray to God, give us another chance, hold off the punishment, I'll do better. That's why in Shmonesra, when we dive in, the first thing we pray for is for wisdom to know what's right and what's wrong. That goes back to the theme of Gan Eden. It's Adat Tovara. And then we bring up the, the concept, it's possible to do tshuva and repent and recognize you've done your mistakes and, and, and show God you understand what I did wrong. And then you ask God, forgive me and hold back your punishment. Don't punish me because I learned my lesson. I won't do that again. That's lachlanu. After I've established that, then I can ask for gula and, and rufuah and parnasah. And, then, and finally gula. 
And therefore, that's the logic of our prayers in Shemun Esri itself. Now, in light of that, I want to go to the Haftarah from, from the Navi Micha. But let, let me summarize my key point. I'm trying to explain that this idea of magical blessings, oh, there's this God, if I say the right magical words, or bring a korban, or go to a high place, that'll get God on my side. That is what Chumash is coming to fight. And that is exactly what God tells um, Bilam. You can do, but you can only do what I let you do. Bilam wants God to allow him to curse. And Chumash is teaching you, if you want God on your side, praying in a high place and bringing sacrifices there is not going to help. Rather, only good behavior will help. Now, later in the story, we'll see, we'll hopefully we'll have time for it later, is that ultimately, what is Bilam when he understands that? What is his next step? How does he get the Jewish people cursed? By getting them to sin. The whole idea of sending the women of Moab to entice the Jewish people to sin, <coughs> that whole sin of Baal Peor is ultimately what brings the curse on the people and thousands of people die in that story. But we don't die because Bilam cursed us. We die because we sinned. Bilam becomes a Russia because he uses his prophetic understanding to get people to sin. Now, Chazal picked a, 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 um, the prophet Micha for the Haftarah for Parsha Bilam. It's from chapter 6 in Micha, but I'm going to go back and open up my, um, open up, you can open up the Haftarah, but I'll share with you the Navi Micha from, um, let me open up another, another Tanakh here. Navi Micha is part of Treyasar. As a rule of thumb, to remember, Micha should be over here. Micha is the same time period as Isaiah, as Yeshayahu, Amos, Yeshayahu, Amos, and Micha, Hoshe, Amos, and Micha, and Yeshayahu are all the same time period. The time period of uh, Yotam, Achaz, Yotam, um, Yishay, I'm sorry, Uziel, Yotam, Achaz, and Chizkiel, the kings of Judah, and Yerobam, the king of Israel. Basically, they begin in a time period of great prosperity. Things are going great. And then during the life of these prophets, the Assyrians, Ashur, becomes a big superpower. God warns them when things are good, when the middle of their prosperity, that's the first several chapters of Isaiah. God says, I bless you with prosperity. Uh, use it properly. God becomes extremely angry because they take those blessings of prosperity and misuse them. Instead of building a just society, they build a corrupt society. And one that doesn't care for the, for the needy and full of corruption and lying and cheating. God gets really angry and says, because of that, I'm going to punish you. And my punishment will be allowing the Assyrians to conquer your country. Um, and the people don't get the message, they don't fix their behavior, and Ashur comes and takes over. In the midst of Ashur attacking first the northern tribes and then Yehuda, the people, because they're scared of the Assyrians and losing in battle, they turn to God in prayer. And if you remember, most of the prayer was done on the Bamot, even in Yehuda. Remember Raka Bamot Asaru? Until Hiskeo's time, people were still serving God on the Bamot. In the northern kingdom, it was always Bamot. And they're bringing sacrifices, but God doesn't answer the prayers. So, um, Bamot begins with talking about um, what's going to happen. God's coming, God's going to come now and, and walk over the land. Or in a nutshell, let, let me actually, let me show you something from Yishayel. If you, if you have your Tach open, Yishayel was the same time period. And he's pretty much Bichas Rebbe. But if you look in Yishayel, Perik, Yud, just one line to, to make sure my point's clear. If you look in Perik, Yud, and Yishayel, Pasuk 5, I think, yeah. In Pasuk Hay, I'll just read quickly. Hoi Ashur Shevet Api Umatev Biyadam Zami. Ho Ashur He's the whip of my anger. God is using his Ashur as his whip. God's allowing Ashur to be powerful and punish Israel because of their bad behavior. I'm going to send him on the nation that's gone against me. I'm going to be the nation that caused me to become angry. I'm going to command them to go and take, to conquer them and to take all their booty and to just destroy them, walk all over them. But he, Ashur himself, doesn't, he's not doing it because uh, he's a tzaddik. Right? Ashur, this evil nation, they're not religious, they don't follow God. Ashur, these evil people just wanting to become superpower and destroy people. But God is allowing them to be successful to punish what we've done wrong 
And then later, God says, after he uses a sword to punish us, then I'm going to go and, if God, I'll pray God the Levav Melech Ashur. I'll punish Ashur. After I finish using the punish you, then I'll punish him for his haughtiness. But that's the theme of, of um, that's the theme of all the prophets of this time period. Now, I'll just give you a quick example from chapter three in Micha. Um, he yells at the people in chapter three. Leadership. You should know what justice is. Instead, you hate doing good and you love doing evil. See the idea of Tovara. You're stealing from the poor. You're not giving people proper clothing. You're, you're, you're using your power to take advantage of, of less fortunate. Okay? And then you're going to cry out to God and God won't answer you. That's prayer. Because you're going to pray to God to help you. You're not worthy of his prayer. Because you are evil in your behavior, God's going to hide his face and not answer your prayer. And the, and the leadership was misleading the people. Okay. Now, this is his great line. Everything straight and make crooked. They build Israel up with, with blood. You shine with iniquity. Yud Aleph is the most beautiful psukim. It's sad. Rasha b'shochad ishpotu. Imagine this thing. The leadership for judging people, everything based on bribes. Kohanel b'mechir yaru. The uh, religious leaders, the Kohanim, working in the temple, they do everything for money and give a psaq based on who gives them more money. Neviya, their other religious leaders, are doing everything for money, also because of Yiksomu. Their whole religious and political leadership is corrupt. Despite all that, Ba'al Adonai yishanu lemor, but they put all their faith in God. We're God's people. We're the Amma Nifcha. We're God's chosen people. We're special. We have this close relationship with God. And therefore, nothing bad can happen to us because we're God's people. This overconfidence because God chose us to serve him, no matter how bad we are, as long as we're praying to God, it's fine. And he says, Because of that attitude, God has to destroy the Beit HaMikdash. Yerushalayim is going to be Bahar Abayin Motiar. If you're coming and praying to God in your temple and bring me korbanot and claiming to be God's people, but your behavior is corrupt, God can't allow that to continue. It's because we're religious in the ritual sense, but unjust in our society, God can't allow that to continue. He has to bring punishment because it can't be that the people representing God and claiming to be God's people act in a way which is unjust. Now, in the meantime, the people are angry with God because Ashur is becoming more and more successful, and God has answered the prayers. This is in chapter six. This is the Torah that we're reading. It says as follows: In chapter six, Micha, Shimu na et Hashem Omer. Listen up, what God is saying. Kum rivet harim b'tishmanu kavod kolecha. God is throwing out his anger and his frustration with the mountains and the high places. He says tishmanu kavod the high places. Hear my voice. Hear your voice. Listen. All you mountains, all you high places, listen up to the quarrel that God has. What quarrel is it? God has a quarrel with his nation, with his people. He's arguing with Am Yisrael. Because Am Yisrael and God are what's called Beregas. They're fighting with each other. Because Am Yisrael is angry. God, how come you're not answering our prayers? What are we doing wrong? We pray to you, you don't answer us. How come you're letting us sure win? And God's trying to tell them, I'm, I'm using Ashur to punish you for your bad behavior. And they don't get it. But we're, we pray to you. Why don't you answer us? What do you want from me, God says? I took you out of Egypt. I took you out of slavery. I redeemed you. So work for me. I gave, I gave you great leadership like Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam. Now listen carefully. The whole share was to understand this line. Ami, my nation. This white staff Torah from Parsha Balak. From the Shittim to Gogal, those are different areas where Ami souls encamped in every Yarden. What happened? Remember the ways that God is always right. Remember to, the man that, in order that you know that God's right and you're wrong. Remember what happened with Balak and Bilam. What happened? What does this mean? Remember what Balak advised and what Bilam answered him. The classic understanding is Balak said, come curse them. And Bilam says, no, I can only see what God said. But I don't think that's, that's what Ya'atz means. 
Yats means give advice. What did Balak, you know, I want to go back to what we did in the shir. My whole point was, Bilam is given permission to do whatever God says. God didn't say don't curse. He didn't say don't bless. He says, only do what I say. And therefore, they're going to try to curse. But before every attempt to curse, they try to get God on their side. And therefore, remember, what did Balak suggest to get God on your side, to allow him to curse? He suggested, let's go to a high place. And what did Bilam answer every time? Build seven altars, bring a sacrifice on the altars, stand by, stand by your korban. Maybe God will allow me to do it now. Maybe if I pray to God and, build sac- and bring sacrifices in high places, that will convince God to help me. And then he says rhetorically, How do I present myself in front of God? How do I make my point to the God from above? Do I present myself with olot, with, with sacrifices, with young, with young calves? Got on thousands of rams and thousands of you know, flowing rivers of, uh, of oil. Does he want my firstborn child? Does he want the offspring of my, does he want human sacrifice? It's, it's this, if you want God on your side, is the way to get God on your side is through sacrifice? No, that, that's all rhetorical. What does God want from you? To receive blessing? The last line of the Torah, I'm sure you've seen that line before, which is the key point that Nabi's making. The main thing God wants is your good behavior. Justice, righteousness, kindness, uh, humility. Um, you know, in, in, a, in, the, in a behavioral sense. And that understanding, what I'm, I'm thinking is quite clear, Micha is saying, why did I give you Parshat Bilam and Balak? Why did, why did I give you that whole parsha of, um, of all these three chapters? Why did I give you Sefer Bilam? Why the detailed story was round after round? And what I'm trying to point out is in, in the parsha and the, and the Aliyah division highlights it. The parsha is screaming, Bilam can only do what God allows him to do. And what is Bilam trying to do in Balak? They're trying to get God on their side. They want to curse the Jewish people, but they want God to help them curse. And they think that by praying and bringing sacrifices in high places, that'll get God on their side. And this teaches us that doesn't work. And that's exactly the argument that Amisro has with God in the time of Micha. Remember, there's the ball of the high places. The people have a quarrel with God. How come you're not answering our prayers? Because they're praying to God and they're bringing sacrifices, but God doesn't answer. But when you read Micha and you read Yishayel and Amos Micha, they're all screaming, God's angry for your corrupt society for your lack of honesty, your lack of kindness, and, and your affluence, and your lack of justice, and bribery, and especially among your leadership. And God's saying, that's why I bring punishment. Internalize that message, and I'll help you. And don't think that just bringing sacrifice is going to save you from Ashur. That's not going to help. The only thing that will save you from Ashur is a, a deep understanding of why God's bringing that punishment. And if you don't internalize that and realize you have to fix your society, Nothing, prayer won't help. So that's, um, so if I go back to what we did in the shir, what I want to suggest is, this is exactly what he's saying. My people, remember what did Balak advise and what did Balaam answer? And that's why in each round, remember those three rounds? Every round is preceded with Balak, let's go to a high place. Maybe that will get God on our side. And but Bilam says, let's build sacrifices and pray to God and bring sacrifices to God on this high place on the mountain. And maybe if we do that, God will allow me to curse. He tries his best and God doesn't let him. Instead, he puts a blessing in his mouth instead. Ultimately, what does Bilam do? That's what, that's what makes Bilam a Rasha. We don't, we don't find out about it. We'll see until, until chapter 31 in Sefer Bamidbar. We don't find out about it until later on. Uh, with the story of the women of Moab, we find out that it was Bilam's idea to send them in. Well, I'll bring that Pasuk in a minute. But Bilam understands the only way to get God to curse his people is if they sin, and therefore he entices them to sin, and that's why he gets God. That's why, you know, it's, we're punished for sinning with with uh, Moab, but later we go to war against Midian uh, for for sending their daughters in, and for listening to Bilam's advice. Uh, let me see, wait, stop the share here for a minute. So what I want to conclude with. I want to conclude, first of all, how do we know that this was Bilam's idea? 
if you go after the war, after the sin of Benot Moab, which you're familiar with, and there's, by the way, this great wordplay about what happened. Remember the word all through the Bilam and Balak story is Lakov, is to curse. Um, let's go back to his first blessing. Let's go back to, I'm sorry, to, to um, what's he saying, his first blessing? Um, who can I curse? That God didn't curse. Then we go to Rosh Hashanah, etc. But the word for cursing here is Lakov. If I jump ahead to chapter 25, what do we find? We start sinning with Benot Moab, and they call um, you know, to join in their sacrifices. They invite them for a business lunch. And God gets angry. Remember, I told you this idea, if you want to God on your side, you feed them. And that's why those two psukim that I made a big deal about, let me go back to them real quickly. In the end of chapter 22, before the three rounds begin, after he arrives, after he arrives in Pasuk 38, and Bilam tells Balak, I can only do what God lets me. What does Bilam do? Bilam and Bilam, Bilam go together to Kiat Chutzot. What do they do? They have a barbecue together. And Balak makes a barbecue of Bakar and Son, sends him to Bilam. Hopefully, that will get Bilam on his side and the start him there with him. Maybe if I give him a nice business lunch, the same idea that I'll get my fellow human on my side by feeding him and sending him gifts, maybe that will convince him. If, um, so that concept is the same idea that they both try later with God. And that's a key concept in classic religion, which comes just, in my opinion, is coming to fight. And there's no doubt the Navim is screaming that all the way through. Now in chapter, um, in chapter, let's go back now to chapter 25. What happens? We have the sin of Baal Por. Now, what's the sin of Baal Por? Por is a, it's called Baal Por. A Baal usually is a rain god. The area, the area of Boav is very parallel to the area of Yehuda. It's like the other side of the Jordan Valley, but you need rain for agriculture. As opposed to uh, Egypt, which has a Nile River for, for water, the area of, of Yehuda and of Moab, those areas that require rain for agriculture. Who's the rain god? The rain god's name is Baal. The area of Por is maybe in Midian, so there the rain god of, of Por is called Baal Por. Now, how would you get rain in ancient times? So the theory that I've heard, which I think makes a lot of sense, it's quite logical. In, in idol worship, what happens? There's a rain god who's in charge of rain. And how are you going to get the rain god excited to bring rain? Well, because they treat gods like human beings, they build a temple for poor. And what do they do in that temple? They have what's called a kdesha. They have a, 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 a female priest, or basically a harlot. And if you have an orgy in the temple, those, if people come... If basically, if this, if, if this God watches um, men and women cohabitating together in his temple, it's like watching, it's like, um, it's like divine pornography. If God sees people doing this in their temple, that'll get the God excited and get him to bring rain. Do you follow what Bapur is? Bapur is an orgy going on inside of a temple. And that, hopefully, by doing that in the temple, together with sacrifice, will bring the rain god, get the rain god excited, and he'll bring rain, and fertilize the ground. Um, now, if you're told, if you need rain, and your Bible says, if you want rain, you have to follow the mitzvot of the Sefer Dvarim, be kind, and give trumot to masrot, and take care of the poor and the needy, and, and be just and honest, and that'll bring rain. And someone else says, come and have a fun time in shul, and, and have this orgy in, your, in this in this temple for this Baal, and that'll bring God, you'll see what happens, how popular that becomes. And therefore, all the Am Yisrael, right, therefore, they invite them to come and join in their, in their ritual. This is the culture of the nation, this hippie culture, and, uh, and everyone falls for it. And therefore, by Tzabed Yisrael, the Baal poor. Now, God gets really angry. We're about to enter Israel, and that's how we start acting right away. The same thing will happen once we cross the Jordan. It's the same culture on the other side. So God says, take the leaders of the people right, and, um, you know, and punish them to get rid of God's anger. Um, 
<coughs> therefore they're commanded to fight Balpor, and then the famous story of the leadership of, of Shevet Shimon and with the women. And this is what happens. Pinchas sees what's happening. He stands up among the Edom. He takes his spear and listen to Pasachet. Here it means their stomach. But it's great wordplay because Lakov was a word which meant cursing before. And now in a similar with a similar spelling, here it means stomach. By Kosh name it is Shabbatish El Kabata. See, Hakuba of Kabata. And that stopped the plague. So the, um, like the, Pimchas killing them through the Kuba, through their stomach, was stopped the curse that was coming because of the bad behavior. And then we talk about 24,000 people die. I think that's the source of the, in the Barkokh revolt of 24, you know, 12, um, 12,000 pairs of of uh, Tamech HaChamim, a total of 24,000 people dying in that plague. The idea of a Magifa with 24,000, I think, comes from here. Now, how do we know this was Bilam's idea? We'll end with this, because by the time it's Tebada. Uh, after this is over, God tells um, Moshe to go fight the Midianim for sending the women in to entice us. So we go to war against Midian, is what they did. When we go to war against Midian, that's not till chapter 31, who do we find? Sure enough, in the war against Midian, we go um, you know, a thousand for everything, and we're led by Pinchas, who leads them in battle. And who do we fight? Machem Midian, all the, the story that were there before. And Bilam ben Baor, all of a sudden, is back in, in he didn't go back to Ram Narayim, he didn't go back home, he stayed to give them advice. And Bilam ben Baor is already now still with Moab and Midian. And then they bring back the, the captives. Then Moshe gets angry for the members of the army bringing back the women as captives. And what's he tell them? Why did you leave the women alive? Pasik Tetzayin. These women, they're the reason why we all sinned. And this sin was Bidvar Bilam. This was all Bilam's idea to get us to sin in front of God. Advar Por. And that's what caused the Magifah. Who's responsible? Not the Chinese, you know, for responsible for the Magifa. It's the Midianite women responsible. And they caused us to sin. We're responsible for sinning with them, but they're responsible for sending them. And therefore, he tells them not to leave them alive. What I need that for is that the sin of Midian is called, the Abnot Midian is called Tvar Bilam, which proves this was Bilam's idea. So if I go back to Perkei Avot and ask myself, why did Chazal say that um, Bilam is the classic example of a rasha compared to Avram Avinu, Avram uses his prophetic understanding of blessings and curses to get people to do good. He's a model of good behavior. And he'll, he'll, he'll inspire his surroundings. He calls out in God's name and teach, begins to teach his theme of ethical monotheism. He brings that into mankind. He takes that understanding of God, which should lead with understood, and becomes transformative and leads to good behavior. Bilam takes that same understanding and uses it as a tool to bring people down, causing them to sin so that God will punish them for their sins. And I think that's why in Turkey Avot, the Avram is compared to Bilam. Uh, but again, I can, have, I can have a prophetic understanding of God and the ways of God. Do I use that understanding to improve society and bring people closer to God? Or, or do I take advantage of that understanding to bring people down? That's going to be the difference between Balak and Bilam, uh, between Bilam and Avram Avinu, which I think Turkey Avot is talking about. But the, my main point for this year was that when you read this the first time around, you get the impression that it's all about magic. That Bilam is this magic magician kind of guy. It's Kosem. That if he says magic words, it'll bring curses and it'll bring, or can bring blessing. And people are always looking for shortcuts like that. Oh, they believe in God, but how do you get God on your side? I'll do something magical, something mystical. And Chumash is screaming all through Chumash. When you read it carefully, it's the exact opposite message. That there is this one God, and the danger of idol worship is not so much a misunderstanding of the existence of God. It's a misunderstanding of the cause and effect of what God expects from man and the cause and effect of God's hashkacha. But once you understand and internalize that God watches over us and judges us based on our behavior, that understanding leads to good behavior, at least to a just society, and leads to what they call the takin olav ha-machut shadat. And that's why ethical monotheism is so central to Judaism, it's not just knowing who's the right God. It's not something intellectual or philosophical, but something very behavioral. 
Um, and because it's so common, even to this day, that if you want God on your side, it's all about ritual and saying magic words and magic things and, and magic actions. Now, ritual is really important when I use it to remember what's the core of my connection to God. When ritual is something you do, you need to do actions to remember how you have to behave. That ritual, that's what we call it. That's our davening. But it's not saying magic words that will get God on your side. It's saying important words, meaningful words, and taking meaningful actions. Like you look at your tzitzit and remember all the mitzvot you have to keep. That's mitzvah tzitzit. So I need, it's not wearing, it's the same thing, the mezuzah. It's not having a special or magic cloth in your mezuzah. Remember what's written on the mezuzah, what the themes are behind the mezuzah, what laws it's representing. And having a mezuzah on my door is going to remind me how I need to behave. And that behavior will bring the blessing on my house. It's not the mezuzah itself doing it, but rather remembering to keep the laws that, that mezuzah represents. So those ideas, I know it's very borderline religion, but it's so easy in religion to look for shortcuts and thinking that it's all about blessings and curses. Everything's magical. And if I want God on my side, I got to get the rest, best mukubo or the best, you know, um, you know, I got to get the best um, you know, ritual acts to do to get my side, as opposed to the deeper understanding is my behavior. That doesn't mean that mitzvot are not important. They're super important, but they have to be understood in their deeper context. So that's our little, I'll take questions now for the last two, three minutes. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask. But that's the main part of this year. Okay, I think you guys have a break now till 1030. But the next year's I think at 1030. So it gives you a 15, 20 minute break in between. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Have a good week and have a, uh, stay healthy, everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh... Siamo, na con, sicuro se siamo. Ciao, disgorta, disgorta. Take it, so got it,